Um, I think what we'll go ahead and do now, and I know there, there is another question in the chat, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce our other panel speakers. And then I think what we'll do is go ahead and just continue with questions. So first I will introduce Dave. So David Cunningham is the farmer, or sorry, farming manager for Bridgewater Dairy in Northwest Ohio. Bridgewater Dairy milks 5,000 plus cows and farms close to 6,000 acres. Prior to coming to Bridgewater Dairy, Dave was the crop production manager for Amana Farms in Iowa, farming 10,000 acres and helping with the beef feedlot manure. Dave also has experience in constructing water, sewer, and animal manure pipelines. And Dave obtained his associate degree in crop production from Ohio State University Agricultural Technical Institute. And then Sue, uh, who, who goes by um, Suzanne, so I know her as Sue, but Su Suzanne has 30 years of experience working with USDA NRCS in multiple states on livestock and manure related practices throughout her career. She is a graduate of Michigan Technological University from Houghton, Michigan, with a PE in civil and environmental engineering. Over the last 21 years, she has focused primarily on manure and wastewater conservation practices and provides technical guidance to Eagle, MDARD, and MSU. So for those of you who don't know, Eagle is um, our environmental agency, and then MDARD's our um, agriculture department. Uh, she is also a committee member with the Michigan Generally Accepted Agricultural Management Practices for Manure and Siting, along with the Michigan Agriculture Environmental Assurance Program advocating for sustainable farming conservation practices. Okay, so at this point, so it looks like Glenn, you answered the question in the chat there. You should probably, we should but, probably have said something about it because I, <laughs> others could be asking. The question was, um, how I would envision manure being delivered to these processors. Uh, would it be a, a line like this, like a transport line, or would it be in tankers? And my reply was that they want 10% solids in the manure. So it probably isn't gonna be pumped there because that's, about as, that's just about as um, solid as we can pump poop. So I think that it probably, they expect it to be done in tankers. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, and I'll just note too that uh, there's a comment in the chat, or sorry, chat. I think offsetting the fuel costs of hauling manure, which is essentially water, would be huge and reduce carbon footprint as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so we're gonna open this up now for the panel to discuss um, any answers to questions. So we do have one question now in the question and answer. The foam pig is an interesting concept. If a producer operated their own buried pipeline, what might be an air source to provide enough air pressure to push a pig through half mile of eight inch or 10 inch pipeline? Well, first of all, be cautious because anytime you're dealing with high pressure, um, there you know people can be hurt, and we've we've got we've had instances of. Uh, of uh, applicators being injured by pipes that have uh, blown apart or caps that have not come off properly. So, but you can rent those types of air compressors. Um, if you go to Facebook, uh, they have um, Manure Kings and several other uh, manure related Facebook pages that are out there. And people are always talking about this for sale or that for sale or rentable. So you're probably talking in a neighborhood of about 10,000 for that. But Again, the people that do this are commercial applicators that are very custom to doing it and, and they'll do a good job. So you just need to make sure that uh, you don't, you, you might want to go watch how it's done for a few times before you ever try something like that yourself. Great. Dave or Sue, did you guys want to expand on that anymore? Or? No, I would just say that, that that kind of stuff is rentable. And if you're not doing it every day, it'd be cheaper to rent that machine than the to own it probably, and to be guaranteed that it will work when you hook it up. So that's always a plus. I might add to the, the question that, that Glenn answered earlier on the uh, uh, processors, uh, both this farm that I'm on now and at Amana, uh, we had methane digesters at the manure location. So we didn't have transportation issues there. We could capture that methane on site and I know we've experimented with some 
phosphor separation uh, systems the same way. So that might help to eliminate some of the transportation costs. Excellent. Okay, a couple more questions in the Q&A. I would be interested to hear if there is a farm that has tried a permanent pipeline of the kind that Glenn describes. Just speaking for Ohio, we have at least two or three. Uh, Dave's got one there at Bridgewater. That's, uh, I don't know, three quarters of a mile or a mile long. And there's a couple others that have been installed. Uh, one was installed specifically because they had um, fields that weren't that far away uh, as the crow flies, but to get to them in a, in a rural area, the hilly area that they lived in, uh, it was like eight miles to get to a field that was only a mile away. So they installed a, a pipe for that very reason. They couldn't put, build a road, so they put the pipe in for that purpose. So we've got at least a couple of those uh, installed in the state of Ohio. My experience that uh, we, we mentioned the one we have here at Bridgewater, and we are, you know, in the future, we'll probably put a, a longer, larger line in here. Uh, but my experience at, in Iowa, uh, we built about nine miles of pipeline there. And we were able to go around a couple of the villages in Amana. And, um, and those villages are tourist uh, areas. So we were able to eliminate the truck traffic through the tourist town and also eliminate a lot of smell. And, uh, one of the things that was briefly mentioned is the cost of the pipeline. Uh, we were hoping to pay that off in two or three years and we built that. And I think we paid it off in about a year and a half with the trucking savings. So it was a pretty big deal for us out there. That's huge. <laughs> yes. Next question in the Q&A. Does Ohio have a standard for the type of piping, pipe joints and testing slash monitoring? Yeah, I do not know. Um, NRCS usually has standards for things. And if they would have gotten cost sharing, I'm sure they would have gone whatever those standards were, but I, I do not know if they have standards. How about Michigan, Suzanne? Would you guys have something up there? Well, we do have uh, our practice standard with NRCS and, and it does um, identify the pressure ratings. Uh, the rating of the pipe has to be 72% of the pipe rating. Um, in, so there we have, we require some check valves, um, backfill prevention if you're connected to a well. Um, type of pipe, the joints need to be watertight. Uh, so uh, the, the, we, and then the NRCS practice standard is nationwide. Um, so when, that wouldn't change from state to state. Now, some states might have more regulations or rules and that would be incorporated into their state NRCS practice standard. Uh, I think that's, I think I answered most of that question. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Okay, next question. What pressure rating do you recommend for the pipe? Well, if you were to talk to our commercial manure applicators, you know, the larger ones are up around 250 PSI for, um, and again, that's at the very start of uh, where the big pump is next to the manure source. As it gets further and further away, of course, the pressure is going to drop. But you would certainly, if you want, want to be at least 72% of the pipe's capacity, then that would tell you the PSI is going to have to be above 300 on the pipe to uh, for a 250 PSI uh, um, system. And again, is that what it's going to be five years from now on uh, on uh, what the applicators are capable of, I don't know. You know, pumps continue to evolve too. So it's a bit of a guessing game, but at least you can move a lot of poop at that pressure. I'd like to add, add to that um, also is uh, when you are looking at the pressure of the system, you should also take into consideration your valves and that they can handle that pressure as well. Um, so that you don't have failures at your valves that, for your system, or you have pressure relief valves to reduce, reduce the pressures in critical areas. And the valves need to, to allow the, the pig to go through. We've had some instances where after installation, uh, blowing them out with, uh, with the pig was not as easy as we thought it might be. So they 
that I end up actually digging them back up and changing some of the valves. Great. Uh, and then a comment based on the last question as far as um, standards. Wisconsin CAPOs are supposed to follow the Wisconsin NRCS practice standard and spec 634. So, all right, next question. How deep do you bury those lines? Do you have issues with frost pushing your pipes up and causing kinks or breakages? The, right. the lines that I buried were all four feet and under. We wanted to be under the frost so that we didn't have those issues. That would make Same. perfect sense. Yeah, go ahead. Sophia. Yeah. Same here, uh, below frost levels, and that changes from state to state. You know, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, you could be six feet in the ground. In the lower part of Michigan, you could be four feet in the ground. So um, you, you want to be below those frost steps. Great. And then another comment, there is an NRCS design spreadsheet, which calculates the operating pressure based on pipe length, diameter, material, and pump curve. Based the selected pipe rating uh, based on calculated pressure. So good information there. Let's see here. Did I miss any questions in the chat? Nope. Oh, here we go. How does NRCS view the need for a fixed pipeline as a resource concern under equip? <laughs> oh, I'm not sure if I'm prepared to answer that one. Um, because I I'm not a planner, I'm I'm an engineer. So that that resource concern, you, um, good question. Uh, I, I will have to come back to that one. <laughs> I I don't want to give a wrong answer. Okay, where is the NRCS design sheet uh, spreadsheet located, and is it available to private engineers? Okay, so that was, uh, oh, I believe, um, from person from Wisconsin. So that spreadsheet would most likely be on the Wisconsin NRCS website under engineering. Um, and the design spreadsheets are usually identified. Um, I, Michigan does not have that one posted. Uh, we do have a, a pipeline thrust design spreadsheet on our engineering website. Um, but that's usually where you can find some of those uh, developed spreadsheets that are used for designs. Um, there was a question in the chat if there was any way we could put those references in the chat. And Glenn did, uh, you did put that in the chat, it looks like. Excellent. Okay. Uh, oh, and another comment, go to the Wisconsin NRCS engineering webpage and look for spreadsheet link. So you should be able to find it there, it sounds like. All right. So I have, um, I have a question. Let me pull it up here. So one of the questions that I have um, what are some potential obstacles to overcome when you're installing a manure pipeline system based on state and federal regulations? So Sue, do you want to kind of start with that one maybe? Um, can you say that question one more time? Yeah. <laughs> what are some of the potential obstacles to overcome when installing a manure pipeline system based on state and federal regulations? Okay. All right, so I go back to an experience I had when I worked in Montana doing livestock pipeline systems and we were on a, the Northern Cheyenne Reservation and needed to cross under a state road. Uh, so we had scheduled a meeting with the Department of Transportation Engineers, uh, went over the project, um, toured the location where we wanted to cross that road um, and we were going to bore under the road, wanted to bore, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't allow us. So you do run into roadblocks um, when, it, when you have to cross a road or even maybe a, a rare road, um, and you have to get those entities in, 
involved in that planning process uh, so that your design can be representative of, of what their requirements will be. Because they will, and they may be different from state to state. So uh, you need to work locally and within your state uh, regulators that have jurisdiction over those uh, crossings. I might add that uh, a pipeline in Amanda, we, we board under railroad highways, a canal, uh, two state roads, and some county roads. So um, you'll encounter a lot of different governing agencies in, the, in a, this kind of adventure. So you just got to be prepared to deal with all of them. Um, in our instance, we had an engineering firm who designed the whole thing. So we had the proper specs for, for crossing each one of those obstacles. And there are specs for every one of them. So you have to be diligent to, to get those right. And uh, especially important around water, but railroads can be unfriendly too if you don't do it right. So um, it's very important to follow the rules. Great, thank you guys so much for answering that. Um, and we did have a comment, uh, I did, someone shared the uh, a link which I put into the chat and also noted to look at the pump sizing spreadsheet. So just wanted to throw that out there. Um, this question is for Dave, and maybe this was already answered or mentioned, but what sort of application area is required to apply dairy waste from his dairy? Oh, let me ask that again, because I'm not sure I caught it all. <laughs> no problem. Um, let me go back here. Why did it go away? There it is, there it is, okay. What sort of application area is required to apply dairy waste from your dairy? Oh, uh, I think a maximum that we're allowed to apply per acre is 13,000 gallon. And that, that is being further restricted with the, the concerns with uh, phosphorus pollution and nitrogen pollution. Uh, phosphorus is our limiting factor. So we actually do variable rate all over our farm and uh, we've cut the rates considerably to try to match our phosphorus levels uh, in every area of the field. So we are encountering more and more restrictions and, uh, but we're set up to do it with the manure uh, pipeline. I don't know whether it's easier that way than, than trucking, but either way we are doing it. And um, so we're, I guess we're we're trying to stay ahead of the regulation uh, on this farm and with our um, soil testing and our, our application, uh, the variable rate application, I should say. So that's real key for us. Proactive versus reactive. Exactly. Yep. Okay, so I do have another question. I think uh, one of the concerns that I know I've heard come up when I've been in discussions about manure pipelines is public right of way. How do you navigate this with townships, you know, drain commissioners, if that's applicable for you, utilities um, and other farmers? So Dave, maybe I'll hand this question to you to start with. And then if Sue or Glenn wanna chime in. On this farm, we try to be on a first name basis with all those uh, folks. And uh, most of them are our neighbors, the township trustees and, and, uh, and the, our drainage guy. I don't know whether you call him a commissioner or not, but he lives right around and uh, within a half a mile of our dairy. So he's very familiar with our processes. And uh, we go a little above and beyond what is necessary to try to communicate with those folks so that when we, when we have an issue, or we have a need, either one, um, we already know those guys and, and they know how uh, important it is for us to do the right thing. So again, we're very proactive with those things and uh, we don't wait till we have a problem to, uh, to have those communication lines open. And we, uh, we all have uh, emergency plans too because lines do break, the trucks do leak. Uh, we have those things, but uh, 
we don't have a history of having those problems because we are proactive about preventing that stuff. Excellent. So it, actually that kind of <laughs> ties into another question that I have. Um, are spill response plans different for these manure pipelines versus, you know, surface transport? I, you, Glenn, you may be able to answer that better, but I don't think so. There's less incidents of spills with the pipeline than there are with the hoses laying clear across several fields. So, yeah, I would agree with that. I think, uh, I think once you have them in place and you've got the soil to help hold them in place, I think you're pretty good. Again, installation is 99% of that. If they were put in right with the, you know, we don't, we don't need 90 degree elbows in these things. We need to understand that to get the fluid to flow the best way possible, we want them to be, uh, you know, fairly straight and then just with small curves to uh, change direction and stuff. So I, I would, you know, those, those, I just emphasize on the spill, uh, the emergency spill thing. I mean, it's uh, it's a lot easier to, to think that's on paper and you always remember it. But if you don't have those cell numbers in your cell phone and you don't have, uh, I mean, it's just pretty difficult when uh, you do have a spill to think clearly because it's uh, pretty emotionally traumatic for the even the commercial manure applicators and the farmers because you're talking about something that's going to take a while to resolve. You know, pretty much the rest of your day is going to be spent containing and cleaning up uh, wherever that manure was spilled if it's in a waterway of any sort so you just need to be able to uh, lay your hands on those phones uh, phone numbers if you've got a person you are counting on with the backhoe to, to plug off something or the person that's going to siphon it back out of a creek if you don't have that type of equipment um, you don't want to be you know starting to look for those numbers at that time you want to have them ready to go and and know exactly how to get that equipment there I would uh, agree, you know, you want to be proactive and have a plan uh, should something go wrong. Um, I did check with our Michigan regulatory agency and um, they don't require a spill plan per se. They, they um, want a ins visual inspection um, during the operation of a pumping system. And um, they, they did not, they, they told me they didn't require a secondary containment, but if you wanna be proactive and have uh, best management practices when you're crossing a water course, having a secondary containment of that hose or um, if you're going through a culvert is I think an important thing to consider. Another one is to have check valves on both sides of that um, crossing. So if you did have a rupture, um, you would be able to stop the waste from flowing or, or having a large uh, spill event. Um, so, uh, and, and another thing I didn't mention is under roads, they typically, or railroads, they typically want you to cross those at 90 degrees and, uh, um, and not less than 45 degrees. So, um, but having a plan in place, I think is an important proactive measure to, to uh, you know, use, utilize. Railroads have a tendency to have things like fiber optic care, cables buried along them and things like that. So, you know, they always say call before you dig and, and that's extraordinarily important in this day and age. I found with the, the pipeline in Amana that uh, the specs for building that were not much different than a potable water line. Um, all the details were there. So those, those specs are well known by contractors. Uh, so they're not difficult, but they are real and you have to abide by it. Um, we did have one question in the chat there and Dave, I don't know if you saw that, but I think that's more directed towards you as far as um, just that this person would love to see photos of bridge of the Bridgewater Dairy Pipeline. So as in where it enters the ground um, and where it emerges and from any other farms, maybe those could be posted with the webinar recording. So I'll, if you want to respond to that individual, that's fine. Or I'll see if I can find it here. Okay. Yeah. It's over in the chat. I see it. Um, 
So I, I am going to move on here to, and actually, I think the, the spell response plan question, I think it lends into another question. Uh, you know, Sue, you kind of mentioned, you know, checking those lines, checking the valves, things like that. Are there inspection points or say like a checklist that people can use to help prevent leaks? Well, if you have a, des a design system, you'll, you also should receive an operation and maintenance plan. Um, and that would outline, you know, your annual or seasonal checks of your system. Um, you know, are your valves working properly? Um, those should be checked. The joints, any exposed joints uh, within the system should be uh, checked. A pressure check on the system. Uh, at, at least annually, um, but then if you're cleaning it out, um, you know that those are good uh, operation and maintenance as well. Yeah, you the systems should have a programmable control panel as a part of it. So if there is a loss in pressure, or um, you're notified by uh, Wi-Fi or an alarm on the system to to indicate a drop in pressure which may be a leak in the system somewhere. Um, and then if you're certainly, if you're connected to any um, well and mixing water within the system, uh, that should have a backflow prevention device on it so that you don't have uh, any contamination to that groundwater. Um, there are, I don't have a, a like, uh, let's see, NRCS has an operation and maintenance plan um, usually post on, on each state's uh, field office tech guide associated with that practice standard. So those are generic, but usually with the designers, um, you'll put those specific informations that uh, the landowner would need to be aware of. Great, excellent, thanks Sue. Um, I don't know, Dave, if you wanted to add anything to that as, at all. No, I, I, I don't have anything. Okay, excellent. We walk over. <laughs> so, uh, you know what, Dave, we're going to swing back to you, though. I do have another question. Are there oh. check valves or flow meters that are required? The uh, That's very specific to what the particular site. I know if you're going to try to push uh, fresh water through that pipeline, you've got to have a good, either a disconnect or um, we've been told that a double check valve will serve as that, uh, I'm, I'm not coming up with the right term, but it, it prevents any contamination, a uh, backflow preventer, uh, a double check valve uh, serves as a backflow preventer. So if we hook into fresh water, we'll either, we'll do that and uh, probably use a soft hose between the well plumbing and the, the manure pipeline is an additional safety factor. So uh, if we need to disconnect, we can disconnect easily. But that is a, a very viable uh, thing. In fact, at Amanda, we talked about uh, using the pipeline to move water to other parts of the farm because at that particular farm, they built a canal 100 years ago and we had an easy water source very close to the uh, the pipeline and if we could pump that into that pipeline we could expand the irrigation very quickly and that was in the 100 year plan when I left but I don't know if that's been done yet but uh, we'll do similar things here if we build a, a larger pipeline is to be able to push water to an irrigation system uh, where we might not be able to put a well. Great. So, Glenn, I'm, I'm going to throw this question to you. Um, how long would you say these pipelines last? You would think, again, if uh, they if they don't, uh, we don't outgrow them. I would think surely you would get 20 years out of uh, out of a pipeline like this at least. Um, again. Depends on installation and whether it matches the pressures and the volumes that we would want to work with down the road. But as far as the deterioration of uh, 
a, a buried pipe, it's pretty minimal. So I would think that you would get quite a bit of usage out of it for a lot of years. I just would emphasize that backflow. If the pipe's going to go uphill, let's just say the contour of the soil dictates that the pipe's going to have an uphill flow. Um, if you're ever on the receiving end of a hose that bursts and has to uh, drain, um, you know, a mile of uh, of hose or more, it's a lot of it's a lot of water or it's a lot of liquid, I should say. So when you get a you know six inch hose, you're probably talking about a gallon a foot. So if you get something larger. Uh, you're talking about multiple gallons per foot of hose. So if, if you're going to get the backflow out of uh, a mile of hose, you're talking about a lot of liquid. It's going to come back in a hurry. That's a good point. I don't really right. want to be on the receiving end of that. <laughs> and, and so that's where a check valve in the system would be beneficial to prevent that backflow of all that volume of liquid. So, you know, having a system that's properly designed is important. So Glenn, you, you mentioned the, um, you know, say you're, you're in a field or, you know, you're, you're moving through places that have kind of that uphill trajectory, I guess, and I should have asked this earlier, but what, um, what potential infield obstacles might you run into as you're running these these lines well you know you've got your uh, your old clay tile that nobody's ever realized was down there from many years ago uh, your field tile that's in place at the current time is another thing that uh, you may be below that but you'll be cutting through it on your way uh, there and then we always you know we're part of uh, where the glaciers covered many years ago so you know uh, we always find stones and other things that have been buried in fields that uh we didn't know there. We'd never been four feet deep or more in some of these fields. So you got to expect to run into uh, um, the darndest thing. So you know, our soil and waters have always done a pretty good job of uh, recording when they used to do, do tile designs for farmers. So you might be able to find something like that at a local soil and water office. Um, but I can just think of you know lots of things that are going to be buried in any given field that we're going to dig up as we go across it. Yep, somebody put a note down there about buried gas and electric lines. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's, <laughs> you definitely don't want to run into those issues, that's for sure. Um, Sue, this is, this is going to be directed to you. Where in the Michigan NRCS info can I find the required type of check valve for a manure pipeline connected to a well? Okay, so... Our state regulatory agency um, under the well construction unit for any backflow prevention associated with the well needs to be an RPZ valve. It's, uh, it needs to be certified by ASSE, American Society of Sanitary Engineers. Um, that Michigan NRCS doesn't maintain a list. Uh, we know that it has to be an RPZ pressure backfill prevention device that is more robust than a double check valve assembly unit. Uh, and that would have to have that ASS. Great. Um, next question that we have in the Q&A, what's the minimum velocity you allow your manure to go through the pipeline to prevent settlement? And maybe that's a good, you know, I know, Glenn, you talked a little bit about the, the maintenance of it, but, you know. Well, I think the commercial applica applicator would say the faster, the better. But usually when you when you envision the when they're finishing up a field and you put the pig in there and you're and it's going down through, we normally envision the pig moving a little faster than a walk, uh, maybe a, a jog type thing. That's the speed that it travels through that uh, manure hose. So that's generally the speed the manure is going anyhow. Um, I don't know if you slowed it down, whether it would make a whole lot of difference or not, but, but I think the percentage of sand might make more of a, an issue because, uh, you know, most commercial manure applicators, given, given a couple of beers, would probably cuss sand as much as they could because it's hard on their pumps and hard on their hoses, hard on getting out of uh, manure tanks. So 
I just don't know if there's a minimum speed that's going to keep it in suspension. I really don't. Dave, do you have any thoughts on that? No, uh, we've left manure lay in pipelines and restarted another day, but you can't leave it there very long uh, because we had an experience that the when we first put the pipeline in in a manner where uh, manure laid over winter because the pipe wasn't cleaned out well. And when that was opened up, it blew valves off the end of the line. And uh, we nearly got some guys hurt, so learned a valuable lesson there. Um, but yeah, you, you just can't leave it in there for a long period of time for sure. The uh, NRCS uh, manure transfer pipe for uh, practice standard recommends uh, velocity between three and six feet per second. Um, is there a recommendation as far as how often you should be cleaning these, these lines out? A lot of times you only use a hose or that, you probably have been there those particular fields perhaps twice a year at most. You know, it might go back to how many fields a hose is going to connect to, because if you got hay in one of them, then you may do two or three applications between cuttings in the year. Whereas you're looking at a field of corn silage or, or dry grain, uh, maybe you'll just do that once the crop's been harvested. So kind of depends, I think, a little bit on um, um, how often you're going to use the hose and for what purposes. I just know that that things like that are out of sight and out of mind and easily forgotten. So, you know, if you're working with a commercial manure applicator, I think that would, I would put that right in the contract with him or her that you're going to blow that line out when you're done with it each time. Yes. Okay. That's good to know. Um, so another, I guess, uh, question are these systems all pressurized or are some potentially gravity flow? Well, in this instance, what we're talking about today, where we're, we're applying manure to fields, they would not be gravity flow. I've, I've seen different pipes used where they'll collect uh, manure or rainwater from a field and it'll travel through a pipe to a storage facility and those are gravity flow. But when we're talking about uh, application, um, volume, volume, volume. So, you know, they, they'll, they'll be under pressure. They'll want to get that done. Great. Um, let me take a look here. I know I had some other questions that people had sent me. And I might hesitate to ask this, but I'll, I'll do it because we know that <laughs> people are wondering, <laughs> is there controversy surrounding these manure pipelines um, and the approval of these types of systems? Dave, any thoughts? In my experience, uh, uh, they nearly held a parade to thank us in Amana because we took the trucks out of town. And they were so thankful to get rid of the, the smelly trucks when they were trying to sell trinkets to tourists that uh, it was just they were beside themselves. But the cost savings was huge. That was what motivated the farm. But here at this in this uh, farm, uh, being able to get the trucks off the roadways anytime we can, what we call direct drag, uh, is huge because uh, any semi, even though uh, we take great care in, in not overloading them. Uh, a truck is heavy and they do damage to these township roads that were designed for horse and buggies, not similar. So, uh, yeah, mostly people appreciate when we can keep it in a pipeline. Yeah, I think, and also, I'm not sure that we would have an approval process that we would go through to install one of these as far as the um, you know, we, if we install a, a permitted farm, then we have an approval process and we have meetings and things. But as Dave said, um, I think most people would appreciate keeping the uh, truck traffic to a minimum. Uh, even the commercial manure applicators have their standards. I've, I've talked to some who will fire truckers for uh, you know, hitting the brakes too quickly when they pull up to a frack tank and causing uh, surface damage to asphalt roads. 
where if they'd have slowed down a little bit, not been in such a hurry, they wouldn't have caused that type of damage. So, you know, they're, I think they tr they're trying to do as, as good a job as they can, be selective. But uh, we've been pretty short on truckers the last couple of seasons, especially this last year. So I think that uh, the pipeline begins to make more sense when you can't get enough trucks in your loop. And if, if uh, we have a general thumb rule that when we're trucking manure, we need about a truck per mile. So if we're going out eight miles, we need a minimum of eight trucks, assuming we can load them pretty fast and unload them pretty fast. So again, there are, there are days when you can find eight trucks rather easily, but there could other be days, uh, could be days where you can't find them, especially when you're talking about silage season, where all of a sudden they can pivot and go from hauling manure to hauling silage. So again, there's competition for all truckers out there. And if you happen to think about this later, you know, or have dreams about it, you never know what you might dream about after the discussions that you have during the day. <laughs> uh, feel free to, to send us a note with any of those questions that you have. 